Hello, this is Dr. Newborn, and this is Christology. We're in Lesson 36, and we're looking at historical evidence of Jesus. A lot through the study today, we're going to be using an outline from The Word Became Flesh, a contemporary incarnational Christology written by Millard Erickson. So it's good to be with you today. Let's go ahead and jump into our study. Uh, as we look at the historical evidence for Jesus, we've got to look at the word history. Now, one of the interesting things that we've seen about this before is some people have suggested that the creation, fall, and reconciliation of mankind can be explained in one phrase, his story. It all comes back to Jesus Christ. But that's not necessarily what we're talking about when we're looking at the history of Christ or the historical evidence for Christ Jesus. Instead, what we're going to look at is an occurrence in the past. What really happened? And so we're going to focus in on really two things, the Jesus of history and the research of the historical Jesus. Now, sometimes when we look at things like this, we can break down archaeology and science and, and we can um, look at how the Christian community interacted with the Jewish community back 2,000 years ago, and we can look at those things. But we can also look at things like oral tradition and how things have passed down or how traditions have passed down from year to year. And so we're going to look at a few of these different things as we get into the study of the historical evidence for Jesus. Now, as we do this, I want to come back to this, uh, this point, that the Bible is the absolute truth of God. And the reason I say that is because the Bible is a historical book that enables us to see really what's happening. It's a, an accurate historical account of things that happened all the way back to the creation of the world through thousands of years up into the time of Christ's coming and then through his death in his burial and resurrection, and then for several decades, leading all the way up to the time of the end of the first century, which is the book of Revelation. Now, as we look at that, what are some of those evidences that speak to us that the Bible is credible? And not just that, it's accurate in its historicity. So there's five proofs of the Bible that the Bible is true. Number one, there's no contradictions. You'll see that in some of what we'll look at today, that when the Bible is shared, there's no contradictions of something that's going on in the New Testament as, as opposed to something in the Old Testament, as well as something that's going on with the Synoptic Gospels or the Canonical Gospels. What we're going to see there is that they're all in line, that that things might seem that they contradict one another, but really the story is clearly there. The events that are there are, are true. And then that there's details for all those types of things. And so it's a very important uh, a point to make that there are no contradictions in the Bible. Number two, archaeology. The more that people dig in the Middle East, the more that they discover the things of the Bible are true. The events of the Bible are accurate. And so when you read about the Hittites, or you read about Sodom and Gomorrah, or you read about David, King David, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, we read about the... Um, the Babylonians and then the Greeks and the, then the Romans and the Medo-Persians and all these people were looking at real events that took place. And so, so when we look at the Holy Land or we look at Jerusalem, we know that these things are accurate as well, especially when we're looking at the New Testament. Number three, science. Science actually proves the Bible is true. There are many examples of how science teaches this, whether it's when a baby boy is circumcised. He's in the Jewish customs and Jewish tradition. The baby boy is circumcised at the perfect time when the chemical in the body of that baby is at its highest, so there won't be any problems with that circumcision. It's very unique when you look at it. Also, God talks a lot about um, how there needs to be sanitation in the camps and how you need to separate things out and and why you eat these types of foods and you don't eat these types of foods. All that science, one of the greatest proofs that the Bible is true scientifically is that it spoke, um, speaks of God that being over the sphere of the earth in Isaiah chapter 40. Now that's interesting because 400 years ago, people thought the earth was flat. But in the scripture, it clearly tells us the 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 earth is a sphere. It's a globe. It's a it's a ball 
like shape. It's round. So uh, it's amazing when you look at how science proves the Bible. Of course, prophecy is the fourth thing. Prophecy is so wonderful because all the prophecies have been fulfilled that we're speaking of Jesus Christ, his coming, and then there will be many prophecies that are yet to be fulfilled or that are yet to be fulfilled that will happen in the future with his second coming. But the prophecies that were laid out early on in the Bible came true. And you see that take place. And then number five, it works. The Bible, the Word of God works. If it's applied to somebody's life dealing with marriage, if it's applied to their life dealing with raising children, or money itself, the leadership skills that are learned through the Bible are true. And and whether it's added to the secular life or whether it's added to a person, of course, who's a child of God, the principles are clear. But of course, we know this as a person gives their life to Christ and the obedience to the word of God, then their life would be right because they would be at peace with God. So people that accept these truths invariably accept the deity of Christ in everything. And so the fact that Christ is, is God and that he was clearly a historical person. Now, as we kind of look in some of the views that are mentioned in The Word Became Flesh uh, book by Millard Erickson, we see a couple of things. Number one, the form critical view. Many oral communities are known for word-for-word -word accounts of tradition. The Christian community was not diligent in passing down word-for-word -word accounts, which led to higher criticism of Scripture. So this seems like it would be a big issue, you know, because they weren't known for that. And so Millard, er Millard, Millard Erickson writes about this in his book saying this was an attack on the Christian communities not passing down a good enough oral account of what was going on but that's when you just take out the power of the Holy Spirit and so Millard Erickson would say no the, the the word of God is being passed down by the power of the Holy Spirit he also brings up another view, the Scandinavian view. Uh, in Judaism, the sayings of Jesus and hence the tradition about Jesus were presumed to be already known. But this tradition was not cited in its verbal form. Early Christian communities preserved their traditions and writings in similar fashion. After all, the early Christian communities were started by Jews. Now, I, I like this kind of, th these quotes and, and, and this quote and, of course, kind of the statement to summarize what's going on. But in the Scandinavian view, which was just given because the people that wrote it were uh, from there, but here's the interesting thing. It says there in the first one, the sayings of Jesus and hence the tradition about Jesus were presumed to be already known. So people knew them. So because they already knew them, it was something that was passing down. Yes, it was being taught, but they knew them and they would carry it on. And that's why the writers of the Gospels, the Synoptic Gospels, as we're going to look at mainly today, they knew these things because it was already in them. Um, Truly, when we think about Jews coming to Christ, that means they're complete Jews. They knew the Old Testament. Now they're just understanding who Christ is, and they're going forward with all that. I thought this was a very good um, quote that I wanted to put into the lesson today about the historical evidence of Jesus for Jesus. The situation as here conceived is not the vague diffusion of narratives, sagas, or anecdotes as we find it in folklore, but the rigidly controlled transmission of matter from one who has the mastery of it to another who has been specially chosen to learn it. The bearer of the tradition and the teacher, the rabbi, watched over its memorizing by his approval, approved pupils, Talmud, and what passed on in the way was in the matter of both of content and form a fixed body of material. Now, we're starting to get into this teaching and this understanding of oral tradition. Things are passed down. They're memorized. People would have known things because they were said so often. And that's how oral communities do things. They say the stories over and over and over the same ways that it's passed down and continues its authenticity. And so that's what we're going to look at a little bit as we continue on. And so when we talk about this one area, the bearer of tradition, the teacher, the rabbi watched over its memorizing, it meant this, that as Jesus, and we can look at the time of Jesus, he was called the rabbi, the perfect rabbi. He was training them as their teacher of the things that they would know. But then we see this, something very interesting, is that once the Holy Spirit comes upon them, 
later on when they are filled with the day of Pentecost, then God will reveal to them and remind them of everything that they learned from Christ so that they would be able to write it down. And that was vital for them because even an oral community can get things wrong. And that's kind of the, that's kind of the issue that we're dealing with here. Even an oral community the tradition can be lost because somebody adds something here or there. Maybe they're very creative people, so they add things on the fly, whatever it might be. And even that might hurt the, um, the tradition some because it changes the story. However, um, this was a, a normal thing that was going on for the disciples, though. This was something that was not going to happen. The Holy Spirit was going to come upon them and teach them. Now, further support of the Scandinavian method, memorization was a popular pedagogical method for home, school, and recollect, recollection of traditions. Um, Jews performed astonishing feats of memorization. They mastered the Torah, prophets, and lists of names in the Chronicles. Now, if you think about all the names that are listed in, in the book, uh, books of Chronicles, it's, it's amazing how many names you can barely pronounce the names that are in the scripture, but they would have memorized them along with the Torah as well. Sometimes when we think of oral traditions, or oral communities, people that don't really have things written down as, as much, you might think of a Native American tribe or, or somebody like this that is passing down um, their belief systems through their stories, and they tell the story so many times that it passes down from generation to generation. And that's similar to what is, is talked about when you're even looking at the Jews or the Christians, because not all of them had the ability to write things down. You couldn't have things in print. Of course, there wasn't a, an easy way to do all those things. And so what they would do is they would share those stories and they would memorize those as well. Um, Albert Lord said this, when we look back over these examples of transmission, we are, I believe, struck by the conservativeness of the tra tradition. The basic story is carefully preserved. So what he's saying is, is that the story in this oral tradition is preserved. So as things pass down, as things pass down over the years, there's something very unique for audible learners and people that are, are watching things and listening to things. They are not distracted. They're taking this in. Now, if you think about oral communities, um, that's not what we think of today. Today, we might look at things on the internet, look online. We're distracted by TV and streaming things and all those uh, opportunities we have with the outlets that we have with social media and media in general. And so there's a lot of distraction. But when these people would tell stories and these people would tell narratives and gives accounts of things that happened in their family, there was a, an absorption of it and that they concentrated so much on it because they wanted to know it verbatim. That was very important for them. And so he speaks of things preserving. Now, things that would happen through this is there would be times when they'd be saying the same thing through a story, but using fewer words. So you would use the same storyline, but you might leave out a few words. And that's, that might seem like it changes the story, but it just doesn't give all the description or all the points. Maybe you're running out of time or whatever it might be, or you don't have the time to do it, or you just want to share something quickly. And so that would happen. Um, sometimes people would add the details to the description, but that would not mess up the true core of the story. Uh, number three, changes of order and sequence. Sometimes a story is told and this, the order of events would be flip-flopped, which would not mess up the true story, and that's what he's making a case for. Number four, additional material not given by the teacher, but found in other writings. So there might be an, a, the story that's shared somewhere else that has some additions to its account. But what you're hearing from the primary source might, so there, what you're hearing from the primary source might be a little bit different. And then number five, there might be omission of things or a substitution of material as well in these types of things. But what, what Albert Lord is saying is that it doesn't change the story. It doesn't change really what's going on. You still have um, the story that's taking place. Now, as we continue, you see that Christian prophets in the formation of the tradition. The church made no distinctions between the words spoken by the earthly Jesus from the risen Lord, meaning that Jesus, when he was walking on the earth in the flesh, 
not in his resurrected body, but in the flesh, he is quoted the same way he's quoted when he's risen, meaning there's consistency there. Um, also, criteria of authenticity. This includes proof that Jesus said what he said. Also, authenticity can be based on the absence of disproof of historicity. What does that mean? People often focus on why the tomb is empty um, instead of the fact that it is empty. Think about that for just a moment. A lot of times people want to hone in on why is it empty? What happened? Or how could it be this way? But really they forget it's empty. And so what I'm saying in that is the lack of evidence is evidence itself. And so that's what we see when we see the absence of disproof of historicity. So um, there's a lack of disproof of disproving Christ that he had an earthly ministry. There's a lack of disproving that, of disproof. So it's important to think of that, that he really did live. So he was, it was, it's an authentic thing that we're looking at. Also, multiple attestation or multiple forms. When two copies slash forms contain the same information, it often authenticates the original. And that's what you see when you see the synoptic gospels and you see Matthew, Mark, and Luke giving us several accounts that are very, very similar. They're saying these things happened. Whether or not they're using one source or not, they're, um, they're uh, attesting the same thing, confirming it. Dissimilarity or discontinuity. Jesus' teaching was different than that of Judaism. It was actually different than anything that's ever been on this earth before. Remember, Jesus says, he says, the law says this, but I tell you, and he speaks uh, in a way of authority. He speaks differently than everybody else. And that's important to look at as well. The gospel is completely different than any other doctrines. Um, it's different in this, that Jesus Christ came down, was sent by loving Heavenly Father, sent to the earth to die in place of sinners. There's nowhere on the, um, on the earth has there been a story even come close to what has happened through the gospel story. And the example uh, of, of another dissimilarity or discontinuity with things that, are, that were done 2,000 years ago is the women were the first witnesses of Jesus' resurrection. And that's spoken of in the Gospels. Now, that's important because that was unusual to tell stories. Um, at that time, women were not usually known as the credible witnesses, of course, that we, we would see them as uh, today. But at that time, it was a little bit different. And so that was a different thing. So um, there, there's a lot of differences when we look at that. If they're going to try to set up a lie and, and try to push that Jesus is the Messiah through a lie, it just wouldn't go well by the way that they did it. Another thing is Palestinian environment. The teaching of Jesus and the disciples aligns with the Palestinian environment at the time. That really matters. What was going on and uh, Jesus' um, work in that time. Coherence. The teaching of Jesus did not change. It remained consistent all throughout his ministry. What he was doing. It did not evolve. It didn't become something different. It was always the same. Unintentionality. Jesus' character and supernatural abilities seem more historical historical than dramatic. The authors of the synoptics did not embellish or exaggerate stories. They simply stated facts as they saw them. That's important because they're not trying to build up something. They're just stating what happened. It's almost descriptive in the way that they're writing, not as much prescriptive. Now, what happens when the Holy Spirit comes upon people, it'll be more prescriptive of how people will live um, and the things that Jesus said as well and how, Jesus, and, and how we're to live. But it's unintentional in a lot of ways. Now, when we're looking at historical evidence, we're going to look at people like this guy, Titus Flavius Josephus. And I want to give you a couple of thoughts on him. In the Testimonium Fl Flavianum, I think is how you say that, the relevant portion declares Josephus wrote, about this time there lived Jesus, a wise man, if indeed one ought to call him a man, for he wrought surprising feats. He was the Christ. When Pilate condemned him to be crucified, those who had come to love him did not give up their affection for him. On the third day, he appeared, restored to life, and the tribe of Christians has not disappeared. He speaks of Jesus. He speaks that he was a true person. There's evidence of that, and he makes that very clear. 
And so that's just kind of a part of this, this teaching here. Also, another person that I'd like to just share what his thoughts are, William Lane Craig. Um, he is American analytical philosopher and Christian theologian. He holds faculty positions at Talbot School of Theology and Houston Baptist University. Craig has lectured on college campuses and debated many scholars about the existence of God. Great debater, very intelligent person. I want you to see what he said about the evidence for Christ. Number one, there was insufficient time for legendary influences to expunge the historical facts. The interval of time between the events themselves and the recording of them in the Gospels is too short to have allowed the memory of what had or had not actually happened to be erased. Number two, the Gospels are not analogous to folk tales or contemporary urban legends. Tales like those of Paul Bunyan and Pico's Bill are, or contemporary urban legends like the Vanishing Hitchhiker rarely concern actual historical individuals and are thus not analogous to the gospel narratives. Great point. Number three, the Jewish transmission of sacred traditions was highly developed and reliable. In an oral culture like that of first century Palestine, the ability to memorize and retain large tracts of oral tradition was a highly prized and highly developed skill. From the earliest age, children in the home, elementary school, and the synagogue were taught to memorize faithfully sacred tradition. The disciples would have exercised similar care with the teachings of Jesus. We've already talked about that a little bit as well. And then number four, there were significant restraints on the embellishment of traditions about Jesus, such as the presence of eyewitnesses and apostle supervision. Since those who had seen and heard Jesus continued to live and the tradition about Jesus remained under the supervision of the apostles, these factors were would act as a natural check on tendencies to elaborate the facts in a direction contrary to that preserved by those who had known Jesus. And then fifthly, the gospel writers have a proven track record of historical reliability. William Lane Craig makes some great points here that are so important when thinking about Jesus being truly a historical figure. And so we see evidence for him not only in the proofs of the Bible, that the Bible is true, but we see that as well as those who are secular historians, and then as well as oral traditions and oral um, communication, how it passed down from generation to generation to give us what we have today. Well, this has been Lesson 36, Historical Evidence of Jesus. Good to be with you. Hope you have a great rest of the day. God bless you. Bye-bye.